time now. All right. I, yeah, I got the notification too. All right. Thank you very much, David. And I appreciate uh, you inviting us here. And uh, I wish everybody a good morning. And uh, hopefully everybody is enjoying uh, the conference so far. Uh, my name is Jerry Allison, and I'm a CPA uh, with Traders Accounting. And today I'm going to be presenting uh, trader tax status versus investor status, what it means to you. And some of you may be thinking, oh man, taxes. I don't want to talk about taxes right now. We just got done with April 15th. And actually uh, now is the perfect time to talk about taxes. And let me explain why. And it's something that's actually uh, become very apparent to me in the last few months. Um, when you're trading, uh, let's go just to, to trading right now. You have a plan to get into a position and you have a plan to get out of a position. And the idea in trading, from what I gather, I've done a little bit, is to get the emotion out, get the reaction out and just stick to your plan. The, one of the problems with taxes is people don't have a plan for that. And so we wanna talk about today plans to get into place. And that's why now is a perfect time to actually discuss and talk about uh, your tax plans and to think about taxes, to get structures set up and get things going in the right direction so you're not caught off guard. And here's why it's become very evident to me this year. I'm sure you all are familiar with the, the AMC and GameStop uh, stuff last year. And there were people that made fortunes off of that. But I have talked to many people, uh, consulted with them, and I find, found a common theme with a lot of them is they made all this money last year, made a fortune last year. And as December 31st went, all that fortune got locked into place with the IRS and they had to pay taxes on it. And then they lost everything in January. And so I'm getting calls in February and March and April saying, you know, I made all this money, I've got to pay taxes on it, but I've lost it all now. What do I do? And I have to guide them through that because there really is nothing to do at that point. And the reason for it is they didn't have a plan. They did not have a tax plan uh, going into anything. They reacted, they made all the money and then lost it all. Of course, this caused across this barrier of the year. And so they, 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 had, they are in a rut right now, quite frankly. They are stuck. And I don't want anybody else to get into that rut. I want, I want everybody to have a tax plan as well as your, your trading plan. You've got that. So that's really where this uh, presentation today is going to focus. It's upon setting up a plan that's right for you to take care of your taxes, to be able to pay those at the end of the year, so, and you're not caught and to minimize the taxes as well. And so that's what we're gonna be discussing. So in this presentation today, we'll cover the presentation and at the end, uh, we're gonna leave it open for some Q and A. Uh, so if anybody has any questions on that. And the, the presentation itself is broken into three pieces, the major pieces. First of all is trader tax status. That's the big piece. We'll be talking about that and how uh, you can utilize that uh, to save some money on taxes, but also to, to reinvest money into your trading. Uh, then we're also going to talk about business structures uh, for a little bit. We'll talk about LLCs, partnerships, uh, C-Corps, S-Corps, things like that. And then at the end, we'll talk about the mark-to-market election and how uh, investors in stocks and options can utilize that uh, to their benefit. So now before we get going too far, I have to go through and make the lawyers happy. So disclaimers, to the best of our knowledge, the information given in this webinar is accurate as the date of the webinar. Tax changes happen constantly. So prior to using the information in the webinar, you should consult with your tax professional. Now, let me pause right here. Um, there is no major tax legislation as far as federally coming through right now. Nobody's talking taxes. It's, it's, it's kind of a mess actually on Capitol Hill. So nobody's talking about changes in tax laws, but that doesn't mean things can't change. 
uh, the IRS commissioner has the authority to change how the existing laws are implemented. And in fact, we had one of those earlier uh, this year uh, dealing with the mark to market election. And the, the commissioner has the authority to change uh, how things are elected, uh, change structures of forms, uh, change due dates, not due dates specifically, but as far as elections and things like that. The non real depth, in depth tax stuff, uh, it's procedural. Let's put it that way. The commissioner has a way to change the procedural stuff. And so that's something that we have to keep an eye on as well. So uh, any information that you get from here, please contact a tax professional and discuss it uh, with them uh, before implementing anything. Uh, the seminar does not establish a professional confidential relationship between you, myself, or Traders Accounting. And Traders Accounting is not a law firm. We are a CPA firm. We do handle tax advice, but we do not prevent, present any legal advice. So that is something that uh, uh, keep in mind. Okay, uh, just a couple quick things about our contact information. Our website, there is a special link here uh, for our website. And I have just put that into uh, the chat so that you have that available. And our phone number is 800-938-9513. And our receptionist, Crystal, there will answer the phone and be happy to set you up uh, with a consultation or whatever uh, you'd like to, to have handled for you. And then, of course, our email address is learn at tradersaccounting.com. Now, <clears throat> Let's get into the presentation here. And remember again, that we're trying to uh, uh, talk about how to, to minimize taxes, but we're also designed to structure a, a plan. Uh, now, the most important thing for any business, well, you know, you go on, I, I used to teach in a college environment, uh, universities, colleges, and I always ask students, I said, what do you think the most thing, important thing for businesses is? And I get all kinds of answers like, uh, oh, customers are, are, are important, great employees, good your reputations, and all those are important. But traders don't have those things. You don't have customers and you don't have employees generally. You might get hire somebody to help trade or trade with you. Um, and you don't even really need a good reputation. Uh, traders don't have those things generally. But every business does have one thing in common. And that's extremely important for the business and it's cash flow. You have to have cash coming in to the business. Now, traders and most businesses, quite frankly, have this mindset of I've got to get cash in, I've got to get revenue in, I got to make profits off of the sale of stock, or I've got in other business, I've got to go out and sell my product, or I've got to go out and sell my services. And that's an extremely important aspect right there. I'm, I don't want to minimize that because regardless of the business, if cash isn't coming in, businesses are going to starve to death. Um, so, but you have a two-edged sword here. Uh, in, in, in a business, you have two-edged sword because you not only have cash coming in, which is most people what most people focus on, but they forget about the second when you have cash going out. Every business, and regardless, if you're in trading, you have a business. You have expenses going out. Uh, when you buy an, a something, a, 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 a stock or an option or a commodity or whatever, when you buy that, you have a trading commission that comes part of the sale. You have an expense right there. You use the internet, you have an expense. You have a computer, you have an expense. You attend seminars and, and courses like this, you have an expense. So people have a lot of expenses. And so the, the points made here in this webinar are that either designed to generate cash flow or to protect cash flow. And that's really the second one is the important one in this webinar. Uh, you guys are learning how to bring in the revenue. You guys are learning how to trade and make a profit. That, that creates the cash flow. But you've got to protect the cash flow going out. Think of it as a bucket. You're, you're, you're a 
bank account, if you will, think of it as a bucket, and you want money coming into the bucket. You want money coming into your account, but there's also holes in the bucket. And those holes can be made smaller, or they can be made bigger by mistakes that you made. And so you're trying to bring money in, but you're also losing money through expenses at the same time. And every business has expenses. You can't eliminate expenses, but you can minimize those expenses. I, I know a person, matter of fact, a guy I've known for 30 years uh, in Iowa, uh, not trader, he's got another type of business, uh, but he's got, he brings in millions of dollars every year, but he's never made a profit. And because of those holes, those expenses that are going out, and he can't figure out why he's losing money. He's losing more money than he's actually getting. And so it's a problem. And if, if nothing else, try to, I'm going to try to get to talk to you today about watching those expenses. Tax is an expense. There are other expenses as well. We want to make sure that we plug up those holes or make those holes small so that we can conserve our cash. And when we conserve cash, we can put it back into investing. All right, well, one thing that's very important uh, for traders, and this is important for any trader, it doesn't matter whether you're dealing stocks, options, futures, commodities, you're dealing with uh, Forex, cryptocurrency, uh, ETFs are actually in the stock and options, and. and uh, forex or not forex but uh, contracts thing but at any rate it's trader tax status now you may have read about this uh, on the irs website or some other sites trader tax status allows a trader to deduct trading expenses from their tax return as a business okay so we're now we're back into our tax realm here uh, we're starting to to think about a plan why would you want to to deduct expenses from your tax return. And we're talking about an individual investor at the moment. Why would you want to do this? Well, let's take an example and then I'll go into a little bit more detail. Suppose a trader with trader tax status deducts a $5,000 training course. If the trader is in the 32% tax bracket, the trader just increased their cash flow by $1,600. They're going to get a $1,600 refund from the IRS back on their taxes or a reduction in taxes because of the $5,000 course. 32% of $5,000 is 16%. They're going to get that back and then they can take that $1,600 and put it back into investing or into trading. And then they've got that money now. See, the goal here is to get money now so you can put it back into trading. Not pay money later, or what well, we want to pay money later, but not get money back later. And the IRS has got a little trap there for people too. Uh, we'll talk about that later uh, in the presentation. So the idea here is to maximize uh, your your bet your expenses on your tax return, your trading expenses, your legitimate trading expenses on your tax return, get some of that money back from the IRS and the state, and reinvest that into trading. However, there is a trap here, and we'll talk about the qualifications of trader tax status here in a second. But I want you to understand the importance of it. That the idea is to deduct those expenses. Here's the trap. It is unwise to spend money just to get a tax deduction. This is, it's, it's foolish to do this and it always results in decreasing cash flow. I knew a guy, oh, probably about 20 years ago. And he, had, he was, an, he was a, a auto repair mechanic. And I was working with him on his uh, bookkeeping and things like that. And it was in December and he said, you know, I'd like to go out and buy this machine for my business to help a tire machine or something like that. I don't remember what it was. It was some $20,000 machine. I said, okay. Um, and he said, how much do you think I would get back on my taxes? Well, I'd say probably about, you know, maybe five, $6,000 for that. And he said, great. I, and then I just asked him, I said, how often are you going to use this? And he said, once or twice a year. I said, you're going to use this machine. You're going to spend $20,000 to 
that you're going to use once or twice a year to get a $5,000 deduction. And he said, yeah. And I said, listen, you're spending, you're going to lose $15,000 as a result of that because you're going to get the $5,000 tax refund, but you've got a $15,000 machine sitting there that's never going to pay for itself. Principle number one in business is never make an expense that, that doesn't pay for itself. Your computer in a trading business pays for itself because it enables you to make those trades. Subscription fees with your broker, they enable you to do things. They end up hopefully paying for themselves, theoretically. But don't, you're not going to go out and get a, a, a car or an airplane or something like that because that's not going to pay for itself in a trading business. It doesn't make any sense. So only spend money that is going to pay for itself and then deduct that money on your tax return. <clears throat> and that helps uh, uh, minimize those holes in the bucket. We want to make those holes as small as possible. So let's look at the, uh, the, the qualifications for trader tax status. Now, the qualifications, the initial qualifications come from IRS publication 550. I strongly recommend that you get IRS publication 550. It's very simple. Just go to the IRS website, irs.gov, and <clears throat> type in publication 550. And that will bring it up. It'll bring it up in HTML format if you just want to read it on your screen, or it brings it up in a PDF format. You can download it to your computer. I have it mine. I have copy downloaded to my computer and refer to it a lot. And it deals with all kinds of investment stuff. I mean, it, for everything from interest to dividends to original issue discounts, bonds, I mean, everything, the whole gamut. So it's quite lengthy, but it, it also deals with trader tax status and later on mark to market. Uh, so that's something that you might want to look at. Now, let's look at the qualifications here. First of all, in IRS Publication 550, in order to do trader tax status, and remember what this is, this is deducting expenses on your personal tax return. You must seek to profit from daily market movements in the prices of securities or commodities and not just from dividends, interest, or capital appreciation. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get dividends or interest or uh, growth, but it means that you're basically trading on a very rapid cycle. Now, not just day trading, it could be swing trading, uh, you could have two, three week cycle, things like that. But the idea is that you're, you're trading pretty rapidly. <clears throat> Second one is your activity must be substantial. And the third one is you must carry on the activity with continuity and regularity. Now, here's the problem. And this is way Congress sets things up. When they set up tax laws, they set things up extremely vaguely. These qualifications are very vague. And that's what Congress does. They set things up uh, it very vaguely and then allows the IRS to try to implement them. And then, of course, we end up with uh, taxpayers and the IRS clashing over it and it goes to court. So in a lot of cases, and this is one specific one, we have to rely on the court cases for uh, the actual uh, characteristic qualifications for trader tax status. So let's look at some of the court cases. We've got three of them here um, that we need to look at. First one is the holding period is short. Uh, so you're for most of what you do, it's going you need to hold it less than 31 days. Well, day traders, you don't have a problem here. Uh, some of you just trade a couple hours a day, boom, bam, done, and that's it. Some of you hold it for a few hours longer. Some of you do swing trades. That's fine. Week or two, however you do it. So Indicott and Commissioner provides us with our first qualification that you are trading for a very short term. You're not holding stocks for a year. You're not holding them for five years. It is something you're, or no, stocks. I said stocks, but I mean, whatever it is you're trading. Second one, and this is really the big one that we look at. Trading occurs 75 to 85, 80% 80 of the trading days per year. So you have to be trading something 
at least three quarters of the trading days per year. You've got to be pretty active in this thing. Now, Poppy versus Commissioner also stated there have to be about at least 700 trades per year. Uh, so some of you are looking at that and saying that's a lot of trades in a year. And some of you are saying that's nothing. Um, I, I've known people, I've talked to people that make 700 trades in three weeks a month. Um, but it depends on what you're trading and how you're trading. So, but that's a qualification. You need to get above that threshold of 700 trades uh, per year. And you need to put in 500 hours trading activity per year. Now that's not just trading, that's also research. Uh, so the 500 hours, that breaks it down into about four to six hours a day that you're actually doing trading and research. And so that's Poppy versus Commissioner. This is one of the key ones that comes out. The last one is K versus Commissioner where they said the intent here is to make a living either solely as a trader or supplementary to other income. The IRS does not want you treating this like a hobby where you do it just once in a while and then you come back to it and things like that. They want you to be treating this like a business. And that's why I keep using that word business because if you get that business mindset where you're actually putting the time in here, uh, then you're gonna meet this qualification. Now, <clears throat> these three things here basically set up what, again, I use the word business. If you were to open a restaurant and you were to go and invite people, say, hey, come to my restaurant and you're open for two or three days and then you decide to take a week off and then you're open for another three days and you decide to take two weeks off or a month and, you know, you're haphazard. That's more of a hobby and your business would fail. Trust me, it would fail there because people couldn't rely on you being open and, and to eat there. Well, this, the same thing holds here. The IRS wants to see a commitment from you. They want you to see, to see a full-time or a part-time business going on here before uh, you start deducting expenses. They don't want people just deducting any expenses, particularly if it looks like a hobby. They want a we want a business set up here. And that the way, that's the way your mindset needs to be. Now, how do we prove this? The best proof of this stuff as an individual trader is your 1099B. Because you can prove the holding period of the, the whatever it is you buy. Uh, now, if you don't get a 1099B or a statement from your broker, then you may be a little bit more, um, need a little bit more work on this. But for most people, you'll get a 1099B you can prove what the holding day is small. Uh, you can prove that you were trading 75% of the days per year because the dates are on there. Um, now your trading activity, that may, that may require a little bit more work because that may show you the, the when you were trading, but it may not add up to all the, the 500 hours. So what we recommend is you keep a journal. Um, Sometimes a lot of our clients keep a journal of what they're doing each day, how much time they've spent. And then the intent to make a living, uh, show that you're actually make, making the money to pull it out and, and use it later on. Have some type of a plan involved. And this is, again, this is where the plan comes into place because if you're just doing this as a hobby, you don't have a plan necessarily. You just come and go as you please. So treat it seriously like a business. And then what happens here when you utilize trader tax status, you can take those expenses and you can write them off on your personal schedule C of your tax return. And when you put them on your personal schedule C, it's a business. Now, let me modify something here. The expenses for your trading business go on the schedule C. The income from your business are still capital gains or uh, 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 could in forexes or other income, something like that. But the income is never going to show up on the Schedule C. So all you have are expenses. Um, now, so you start deducting these expenses on your Schedule C. And as a result, you lower your tax burden. You get money back from the IRS take that money and you reinvest it. That's the ideal situation of what we want. 
We want to be able to maximize your cash flow. We want to be able to put money back into trading, and we want to be able to use the tax laws for our advantage. Now, <clears throat> there's a problem. There always is in the tax code. I just mentioned that you're going to deduct expenses on your Schedule C of your personal tax return. There are two issues with that. First of all, Schedule C has been around for a long time. And unfortunately, people have tried to abuse the Schedule C by writing off hobby expenses and other expenses that they shouldn't be writing on. So the Schedule C has become the number one most targeted thing by the IRS. So if you're going to utilize trader tax status, keep do that with the mind that you're going to eventually probably be audited. Second thing, on a Schedule C, and I learned this when I was a, a wee accountant way back in the 1980s, um, with a Schedule C, when you start that on your tax, the Schedule C, to have a profit after three years. And after three years, they start to get a little bit curious about things and start getting their nose into things if you're not, because they may start thinking it's a hobby, running it right, uh, and maybe need to get out of it. Traders never have a profit on the Schedule C because remember, I just mentioned the income from trading are gains. And so they go someplace else on the tax return, either Schedule C. on Schedule C. So all you have on a Schedule C are expenses, which therefore that always shows a loss on the Schedule C. So after three years, the IRS may start getting interested in you. Um, so the second tactic that we want to start looking at is not only trader tax status, we want to start looking at maybe some other things here to eliminate the IRS scrutiny. And so are there other ways to increase tax cash flow? And we'll see how this merges with IRS scrutiny here in a second. We can form a trading business, usually an LLC, where all the trading and expenses can be reported. Uh, that is very useful. Now, follow with me here because when we, we create an LLC, uh, though LLCs are state entities. They are not federal entities. And so what happens as every state has different requirements for setting up a, an LLC and maintaining an LLC. So that is however it's done in your state. Um, so you usually set up an LLC here uh, to do that. Now, while there's a fee for setting up an LLC, which is a decrease in cash flow, the IRS is less likely to scrutinize a legitimately formed business where trader tax status is not of a big of an issue. Now, let me explain that. This is for mostly for LLCs, there's one exception, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. When you set up an LLC, except for the one time, it sets up a, a separate tax return off of your personal tax return that's filed as if it's a legitimate business. And not saying trading is not a legitimate, legitimate business, but it looks better. And so you get this tax return, you file this tax return separately from your personal tax return. And the IRS is less likely to scrutinize that than that Schedule C on your personal return. The goal is to get rid of that Schedule C on your personal return and get it off onto a second return outside of your personal return so that the IRS is less likely to scrutinize it. And as a bonus, notice here that the IRS doesn't look at trader tax status as heavily. So you not only get it off your Schedule C, you may not have to worry about the 700 trades per year, or the four to six hours uh, per day. Uh, all of those qualifications about deducting expenses on a Schedule C, you may not have to worry about as much because you've got this set up business, the separate business set up uh, that's off of your personal tax return. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, I can undergo Skyrus scrutiny because I can go prove everything. <clears throat> and whenever a client or, or a, a consult uh, tells me that, I always ask them, I said, okay, 
that's great. You may have a perfect tax return, but can you afford the 10 to 20 hours to sit in front of the IRS and justify every number on there? Because time is money. And the cost of the IRS scrutiny, you may have the most perfect tax return in the world, but sitting there having to justify every number takes away from time and may very well take away time from trading and definitely time from research. Uh, so the cost of IRS scrutiny can far exceed the cost of maintaining an LLC. This We consider this insurance. All of you have insurance on either your apartment or your house. And you do that in case there is a major loss, like a fire, your insurance will kick in. So you spend a little bit of money for insurance to avoid a huge uh, problem later on if you were to have a fire. That's what this is. Uh, the bucket, let's go back to the bucket example. I usually, when we talk about holes in the bucket there, I usually say we put a little hole in the bucket which is the LLC expense to avoid a huge hole of the IRS scrutiny later on. And so it really helps uh, minimize the, the, this IRS scrutiny. We pay a little bit in insurance, if you will, and to get rid of that, and hopefully everything's fine after that. <clears throat> now, let's talk about LLCs for a little bit. What type of LLC? There's a couple different types of LLCs that can be formed. First one is a single member and a multiple member. Fees generally the same depending upon the states. Um, the single member only has one member. Uh, people form that with one person, an individual. Multiple members, you have two or more people. Now, with multiple members, husband and wife teams do count. Or you can do a yourself and a, a trust, you know, things like that. There's ways to get that done. Now, a single member LLC, one person, a sole proprietorship, is generally taxed on a Schedule C of the personal tax return. This is the one exception I was talking about a little bit ago. This is the one that creates the problem for you because if you form a single member LLC, it ends right back up on the Schedule C of your tax return and does absolutely nothing for you. It puts you right back in the target of the IRS it uh, still allows you to deduct your expenses. I mean, that, that's no, but it does, you just went through all that expense of setting up an LLC really for nothing. So it ends up where it doesn't need to be. So if you're going to go um, a single member LLC route, then you need to go straight to um, an S corporation or C corporation election. Now let me explain that. One, th one thing that's nice about LLCs is since they are not federal entities, they're only state entities, you can elect how you're going to be taxed with the IRS. So if you form a single member LLC, uh, the def default is if you don't elect anything, it goes onto the Schedule C of your tax return. However, within 75 days of forming an LLC, you can actually elect to be treated as an S corporation or you can elect to be treated as the C corporation. If you're going to go the single member uh, LLC route, immediately go to an S corporation or C corporation uh, because you do not want this on your Schedule C of your tax return. So that is one route <clears throat> that you can go. Okay, the multiple member LLC is generally taxed as a partnership, that's the default, but you can elect to be taxed as an S corporation or a C corporation as well. Now, <clears throat> some of you may be thinking, well, why not just start a partnership or why not just start an S corporation or C corporation right away and not do the LLC? Well, that's because the LLC has a unique advantage of not only being able to choose how it's going to be taxed, but it can change how it's going to be taxed. So for example, let's say I take a multi-member LLC that starts out of a partnership. And this is something I recommend to my clients. I say, start out as a partnership, a simple partnership. And let's review it after a year. And if you want to build on that, then we file an election with the IRS to be, be taxed as an S corporation. All right, we let the S corporation go for a few years. If tax laws change, 
or if uh, circumstances change or needs change, we can always go back to the partnership or we can go go to a C corporation then. And then a few years later, we can go back again. And so the, the L, multi member LLC and single member for all intents and purposes can change how it's going to be taxed, you just have to file with the IRS. And that's nice. However, if you go straight to S corporation, you file a what what happened there is in with a state you you start a C corporation then you elect S corporation status, but once you do that you're stuck. You can go from an S corporation to a C corporation back and forth, but you cannot go anyplace else. It's just you're limited to those two. So with an LLC you have extreme flexibility there as to how as to how you're going to be taxed. Uh, <clears throat> now one side note here. Um, S corporations, the only thing people that can own S corporations are US citizens and US trusts and certain trusts, let me put it that way. So you have to be careful about that um, and setting that up to make sure those qualifications and you can only have 30 members uh, or 30 owners to an LLC or to an S corporation, but most traders don't have a problem with that one. Now, again, the number one most audited business is that single member LLC Schedule C. Avoid that one. Now with these other entities, whether it's a <clears throat> partnership, a S corporation, C corporation, however you're being taxed, you still get to write off your expenses, still claim the, the income, you still get to write off your expenses. And what's nice about a partnership or an S corporation is those are what are called pass-through entities. The partnership and the S corporation do not pay any tax income taxes themselves. They file informational returns. And then to report what they report to the IRS is how much each partner should claim on their personal tax returns. So the, the individual owners actually pay the taxes on their personal returns. And so everything gets combined on your personal return anyway, but it comes through on a cleaner, as a cleaner method than filing it on that schedule c of your personal tax return <clears throat> so that is something to pay attention to now something else here also about s corps and c corps s corps and c corps require the officers to be paid a salary now <clears throat> that when i talk about salary i mean usually a monthly salary it could be a yearly salary but you've got fica withholding You've got federal income tax withholding. You've got state withholding. You're going to have federal and state unemployment on that. It has to be accounted for. And so uh, that is a requirement. Uh, so you end up paying extra FICA tax as a result of that. Now, there are certain cases where you want to do that. Um, uh, we can talk about that. I do not have time to go into that right now but there are cases where you might want to set up an S Corp or a C Corp and pay that salary. So what does traders accounting recommend? Well, depending on the situation, we usually recommend forming a multi-member LLC to be taxed as a partnership. Uh, we do not recommend a single member LLC because again, that puts it right back on your Schedule C of your tax return and those expenses on the Schedule C are eventually going to get you targeted by the IRS. So what this does, a multi-member LLC to be taxed as a partnership, we start out with partnership. Now, again, I mentioned a little bit ago, you and your wife or your spouse, sorry, uh, you and your spouse could could do this, you could do it with the, uh, you could own 99% of it, another family member could own 1%. You could set up a family trust where you put 1% of the, of the income into the trust to save up for family members. That's another way to do it. And there's more complex structures, but it, even if you're the only person and you have no family, no friends, whatever, we could still get it set up for you. There's a way to get it set up. Uh, and do it. Uh, it gets into the more complex structures, but that's generally what we recommend is this multi-member LLC because it gets it off your personal tax return, allows you to actually deduct those expenses and gets you all the best of both worlds there. And so the, as I mentioned, this creates a trading business where expenses can be uh, deducted. 
Schedule C is eliminated from your personal tax return and it uh, reduces your audit risk. So now you've got expenses being deducted, you've got a reduction in audit risk. And so now you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting, uh, you're getting reduced tax benefits. So you can take the money back and put it back into investing. And then the partners, whether it's partnership, but this could be this true of a C or S corp as well. Uh, partners still claim their share of income on their personal returns as a share of a legitimate business. It looks like in this case where it comes through to your personal return, it looks like you're investing in a, in a legitimate business rather than having just all these expenses showing up on <coughs> your tax return. <clears throat> and then of course, the, you can also, as a result of this, you can claim a home office deduction on your personal tax return and, and get more of a deduction and increase uh, your cash flow. <clears throat> now, why is this important? Well, the IRS will allow you, now the office in your house that you use for trading, uh, first of all, has to be used 100% for your business. Uh, it can't be used for anything else. If it is, then they wipe out the deduction. But just the simplified method, will get, the IRS will give you $5 per square foot up to 300 square feet. So the maximum there on the simplified method is $1,500. I mean, that's $1,500 right off your <clears throat> expense as, as an additional expense uh, right there. If you go the other route, the non-simplified, we could take a percentage of your uh, rent or mortgage interest and real estate taxes, uh, percentage of your uh, uh, insurance, take a percentage of any repairs or maintenance, uh, homeowners association dues, utilities, you know, anything that goes into the upkeep of your residence. We take a percentage of that, can write it off as a uh, deduction. Now, another benefit with the LLC here um, you can try to do the home office deduction on your Schedule C. The problem is you won't get it because the Schedule C always shows a loss. And if you're showing a loss on a Schedule C, then the home office deduction will not be a reduction of anything. It will just be a carry forward and you just end up carrying this stuff forward indefinitely. But with a partnership or an S corporation, you can take the home office deduction and it just reduces it even further. So it works out really nice with that LLC. <clears throat> All right, now we've talked about trader tax status, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> which is deducting expenses on your personal tax return. We've talked about different types of entities. Now we're gonna talk about the mark to market election. The mark to market election and trader tax status are two different things. Trader tax status is deducting expenses Mark to market has to do with the revenue side or the income side of things, the gains and gains and losses of uh, your trading activity. So it's basically another accounting method. Some of you may have heard or be familiar with accounting, you know about cash accounting versus accrual accounting. This is an alternative accounting method. And what it does, it values your account, your, your trading account at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, and basically determines if there's a gain, that's what you pay tax on. If there's a loss, then that's, you get that as a deduction right up. <clears throat> now, by the way, mark to market is only beneficial for those trading stocks, options, and in some limited capacity, uh, uh, cryptocurrency. Now, why is this the, it, it, why is this different? Well, what happens is for those of you who've traded stocks and options, you know about wash sales. Now I'm not gonna get into what wash sales are and why, but wash sales basically defer your losses this year into next year. So you end up paying taxes now, hoping to get it back on next year's tax return. Mark to market does away with that. There's no loss deferral there. Also, under standard accounting, <clears throat> if you lose more money in a year than what you, you gained, in other words, you have a net loss for the year, 
then you can only deduct $3,000 on your tax return and you have to carry the rest forward. So for example, if I had a net loss of $10,000 in 2021, I could only write off 3,000 on my tax return and carry the rest, remaining 7,000 forward to 2022. Mark to market does away with that. That's another loss deferral. And remember, we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to save money now and pay taxes later. The, the standard without mark to market, the IRS tries to get you to pay taxes now and get it back later. It's completely opposite. So this is a, a way of valuing your account so that you actually pay taxes on what you gained or you lost. And it's a truer method of what's doing thing. It also, with the mark to market election, it converts uh, the capital gains into ordinary gains. So they're not gains or losses anymore. They're ordinary and can be used against other income like W-2 income or pension income. So <clears throat> that this is a huge benefit here. So you're not limited to uh, the $3,000 limit anymore. If you lose $50,000 in a year, you can write the whole thing off in that year. So you're reducing your tax load now and, and you just go on. And of course, the trading account's no longer subject to wash sale rules, increase, increasing your cash flow. So the mark to market election is really a huge benefit for people trading stocks and options who incur wash sales. Uh, the limit on the cryptocurrency, there's no wash sales in cryptocurrency, but there is a $3,000 limitation uh, that we can get around on uh, cryptocurrency. So it could benefit that. So usually if somebody's trading stocks, options, and cryptocurrency, we tie all of them together so they can have the be best benefit out of all of that. <clears throat> Finally, as I mentioned, this election is best for those trading stocks and options. Now, how do you make this election? <clears throat> well, you can make this election as an individual. You can also make this as another type of business, an LLC, if you like. For individuals uh, and any existing business, that election had to be made by April 16th or April 18th of this year. It is too late this year to make that election. So your next time you could make that for yourself or for an existing business, uh, then it would have to be by April 15th of next year. However, if you create a new entity, like a new LLC, like we were talking about, you can make that election for that LLC when you create it. And actually you don't have to file the election until the first tax return. So for example, if I created an LLC partnership today, I could go ahead and set up my brokerage accounts under the LLC EIN, start trading, tell my broker I'm going to take the mark to market election. And then when I file that first tax return for the partnership, I make the election for mark to market and I'm good to go. So that is the only way you can get mark to market for 2022 right now is to create a brand new entity. Um, <clears throat> And all that information, again, is in publication 550. If you want to research that, the language for the election is there as well. Now, let's go on to another disclaimer here. The paths recommended here are general recommendations and may not fit your particular situations and goal. There is no one size fits all plan. Everybody's different. Everybody's got different needs. Uh, so when we talk to people, we do a lot of consulting. Uh, we talk to people, we say, okay, an LLC partnership would be good for you. But when I talk to the next person, oh, you've got this need, maybe an S corporation and pay yourself that salary so that we can do certain things. Or a C corp might be best for you. Uh, so everybody's different. We have to talk to you and figure out what is best for you uh, in order to get the maximum benefits for you. Now, let me talk just briefly about traders accounting. And what we do, um, we're about to close up this presentation, but let me tell you about Traders Accounting. First of all, uh, we do provide the entity and cre creation and maintenance. We can create those LLCs uh, if you want us to. Uh, please contact us. Um, uh, our uh, business manager and entity formation specialist, Raven Johnson, uh, she can usually get that done pretty quickly. 
uh, usually in about two weeks, although I have some seen some created in like three or four days. So um, <clears throat> that, that could go pretty quickly if you want it to. Uh, we also do bookkeeping for trading businesses mark to market or not. Now that doesn't sound like much. Why would you need a bookkeeper? Well, a bookkeeper takes your mind off of the financial picture where you can concentrate on trading and it keeps clean financial statements so that at the end of the year, we can just take those financial statements, put them right onto a tax return without having to mess with you finding documents and expenses and stuff like that because it's been kept up monthly. Uh, we also provide income tax preparation for all types of returns. We do individuals with C Schedule C's, we do partnerships, LLC's, we do S corporations, C corporations, and we can do the trust returns if necessary. Uh, so we do all kinds of those tax returns, uh, how, whatever's needed. And then, of course, we do tax and entity consulting. <clears throat> uh, if you just want us to, to consult with you, uh, you can call us up, set an appointment, and then we can uh, consult uh, with you. Um, finally, before we get to questions here, let me talk about our information. Uh, Raven Johnson, our entity specialist, will give you a free 30-minute consultation to find out your best options. And so she will gladly sit down and talk with you. Our phone number is 800-938-9513. And that link that is in the chat, if you click on that, you can set up an appointment there. Um, so certainly call, you have nothing to lose by contacting her and setting up that appointment. Um, and then of course, I'll leave this on the screen right now, but if there are any questions, I know we've got a couple that are already uh, up there and I know I've got just a few more minutes before uh, David is gonna cut me off. Um, I know some of you are in Canada and somebody did mention about Canadian tax. I cannot talk about Canadian tax. I have not researched that or I am not a, I'm a CPA and only know about US tax. However, uh, you know, this mark to market stuff and trader tax status, it's in the US tax code. So I would research it in the in Canada or if you live in another country, certainly research it because there's benefits there. Um, but uh, get somebody in the know and talk to them. Uh, Erica asked about what's the best entity to use for trading futures? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> again, I, generally not knowing your situation, I would not trade futures under a Schedule C or a single member LLC. I would still go to either a uh, LLC partnership, S corporation or C corporation, one of those. Um, and quite frankly, we steer away from C corporations a lot. There's a lot of problems there. Um, I'm not going to get into it right now. Um, now, futures are a little bit different because the tax structure is different. You do not want to use mark to market with that because uh, futures are already done mark to market. And 60% of futures, regardless, if you trade futures daily, something unique happens for you. Um, because 60% of your gains at the end of the year go as long-term capital gains, even though you may not hold any, held anything longer than a day. So you get a 60% long-term capital gains benefit on your income and futures and commodities, and the maximum tax rate is 20%. And so that is a huge benefit. So don't even think about mark-to-market if you're trading futures or commodities. Um, just leave it as is, but definitely try to get it off your personal tax return onto a partnership or an S corporation. Okay, anybody else have any questions before I turn this back over to David? I am not seeing any come up. I do want to thank David for having us on. Uh, uh, it was nice to come as this is a new presentation for us. And it was great to be here and I appreciate all of you coming by and, uh, and visiting with us. So, uh, David, you there? Yeah, yeah, uh, great presentation. So, uh, yeah, this is a good example of why I wanted to add the uh, discipline and time management uh, aspects to the, uh, this, this event because uh, uh, those, uh, you know, a lot of what you covered is uh, definitely relates to that and, and very important for, for any business. 
and just okay. to add one more point, if I've got some time here, um, yeah. all of this, I mean, I talked at the beginning about setting a plan for taxes. If you do not set a plan, then this mess, this tax stuff messes with your psychology and trading. And I noticed that was one of the mm -hmm. themes here. And I've, I've talked to a lot of people that say, oh, I can't trade anymore because my tax burdens get too low or I'm worried about my taxes. Well, that when that enters the picture of trading, that screws up everything for your trading. And you're, you're probably going to lose money as a result of it. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, and uh, I've, I've known Raven for well over a decade, I think. So. Oh, good. I, I, okay. I've... Uh, you know, wanted to have, uh, you know, someone from your organization on for a while. So it's uh, great to have you here. So fantastic. It was great to be here and I appreciate you having us. All right. Thanks, Jerry. All right. Have a good one, everybody. Bye.